Hi, uh, welcome to our next webinar, um, Navigating uh, Through Volatility webinar with Robbie Kilman Baxter on uh, Navigating Through Volatility with a Forever Transaction. Um, how to establish customer loyalty is especially critical during these times, so I'm really excited today to have Robbie with us. Uh, Robbie is the founder of Peninsula Strategies, a consulting firm that helps companies excel in the membership economy and a subject matter expert on the membership models and subscription pricing. Uh, her first book, The Membership Economy, Find Your Superstars, Mastering the Forever super Conversation. Users. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, you're right, super users. I like superstars <laughs> too. <laughs> I like that. So uh, The Membership Economy, Find Your Super Users, Master the Forever Transaction and Build Recurring Revenue is an international bestseller. In her widely anticipated and now released, uh, The Forever Transaction is now available. Um, her clients have included uh, Microsoft, The Wall Street Journal, and Electronic Arts, as well as over 100 other membership economy organizations. And I know she's um, spoken to and has um, several manufacturing uh, clients and um, heavy equipment clients. So it should be really interesting to hear uh, what Robbie has to say. As a public speaker, uh, Robbie's been has presented to thousands of people and corporations and associations, universities, has been quoted all over, including major media outlets uh, like Harvard Business Review. So with that said, uh, we'll welcome we'll, uh, I welcome Robbie to uh, start speaking. Uh, before we get started, though, I'd like to ask you to submit uh, questions through the Q and A or the chat box. Um, uh, Robbie would like to make this interactive, so uh, please um, send questions your way. And so with that said, we'll turn it over to you, Robbie. Yeah, thanks so much for the nice, um, the warm welcome and, and, uh, and nice introduction. I really appreciate it. I am going to, um, let's see, where, I think we're going to go right here. Share your screen, perhaps. Sharing my screen. All right. And here we go. Well, and Robbie and I have worked, uh, have known each other for many years now. We both are in the same uh, consulting uh, society and group. So, so do you see the forever yep. transaction? I can see it. Attracting, engaging, retaining. Okay, perfect. So, um, first of all, this is you know when Lisa and I talked, you know last last fall or even early this spring about maybe doing something together. Um, for Apex, this was not the talk that I was going to give. I was going to be talking about, you know, this new book, The Forever Transaction, and what it means for organizations that are moving from, you know, one-time events to recurring revenue relationships, what the implications are for the operations teams, uh, what it means for the supply chain, um, and how all the pieces fit together. And it was also going to be a little bit of a celebration, like, hey, <laughs> yay, you know, new book. This is, you know, an exciting moment. Um, but, but this is not actually where we are, you know, here in May, uh, week seven, week eight for some of us of sheltering in place um, and the chaos that was created by, uh, you know, this, uh, this physical distancing that we're all dealing with. Um, so what I want to do is, you know, as Lisa said, just share some of the, the work I've been doing, talk a little bit about what is specific to right now and navigating through this volatility, these, these uncharted uh, waters, um, and, uh, and then open it up for, for conversation. We're a, we're a fairly manageable group, so hopefully we can, we can have some, some dynamic discussion. So, you know, this is a, a new world, and I mean that in two ways. You know, the, my usual way of thinking about this is, you know, this subscription-oriented world where everybody is, is trying to do subscriptions and membership. Um, but I also mean this moment right now where everything seems to be on hold a lot of businesses even with pretty deep resources are like hunkering down and not not investing and not moving forward and kind of operating out of fear while other businesses are you know leaping ahead with unprecedented demand 
Um, so it's just, it's just a funny time. Um, you know, the bad news is it's pretty bad. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, people losing their jobs. Uh, Lisa and I were just chatting about how in a lot of parts of the world, you know, shipments just don't come. Um, you know, factories are closed, things aren't getting built, uh, animals aren't being processed, you know, it's, it's a really kind of a rough time right now. Um, people are losing their jobs, uh, things are being canceled, trainings and conferences are being canceled. Um, but there, there are some good things. Um, and it's really about, you know, what's good on both the consumer or customer side and also what's good on the business side. Um, you know, in the world of customers, customers are suddenly more open to doing things in a different way than they've done before. So that might mean, you know, companies that have said, you know, historically, no, we want a live person to help us or to come to our factory or to come talk to us. Uh, we don't really do the digital thing. Um, that's a different way of doing business. I've always done it my own way, you know, just by talking to people in real time. And, you know, suddenly customers are more flexible because they have no choices. You know, um, my a close to home example, my mom is in her 70s and every day, you know, she pretty much goes to her yoga class, goes to the supermarket to pick up dinner for my dad and her, and then does some kind of a social event in person, like a book club. And in the last seven weeks, that has radically changed. She's doing yoga in her bathroom now with a space heater and using the steam from the shower to create a Bikram environment, um, and then streaming the, the, uh, the class. Um, she's getting her food delivered uh, through Instacart and a bunch of other sources. So she's become really savvy about kind of using technology for, for her deliveries. And she's connecting with her friends on Zoom and Google Hangouts and the new Facebook uh, rooms. I think it is Facebook Messenger rooms. So, you know, consumers are willing to change their behaviors right now. Um, and it's a great opportunity. So if there's something that you've been trying, some kind of new innovation where you've been seeing a lot of pushback, this is a moment. We're having a moment where uh, people are willing to try new things. Um, it's also true inside our organization. So um, something I'm seeing with my clients is, you know, a lot of times our projects are kind of off in the corner, like, oh, let's try let's try going direct to consumer. Let's try, um, you know, rethinking the services around the piece of equipment. You know, that might be an interesting thing to try, but it's way over here as like some little experiment. And suddenly these businesses, leadership is saying, wait, that's actually something that either our customers are now demanding or that we can see as actually being a profitable part of our business today because of where the world is going. And suddenly a lot of these projects are becoming strategic and important. Um, I would imagine for many of you, you know, projects to optimize you know, distributed manufacturing or um, improving the ability to know, you know where shipments are and what's holding them up, suddenly that's becoming, instead of it being like a tactical, you know, small improvement, it's becoming strategic to the whole organization. Being able to pivot um, what you're able to manufacture quickly and get it where it needs to go, suddenly these are, you know, highly strategic and important questions. So um, there's, there's a moment right now for, for all of us to share our expertise and to move our projects forward really, really rapidly. Um, the other thing that I'll point out that I'm seeing is in a lot of cases, um, the processes for moving new initiatives forward has been like completely transformed and is so rapid right now. So, you know, I was talking to one client that said, you know, I'm working with them on launching a new um, leadership program, a training program for leadership. And they said, you know, that was backburnered. And suddenly we're just allowed to do whatever we want. Like we can just move really quickly forward. There's, you know, there used to be like 12 gates before we got our funding, before we got our technology, before we could experiment. And suddenly we just have a green light to go. So this is an opportunity to ask for forgiveness later and to move really quickly forward and innovate. 
Um, so for those of us who felt like, you know, we've been handcuffed and <laughs> kept back, this is an opportunity for us, um, which I'm finding really exciting. And I'm seeing uh, a lot of organizations kind of coming out of the fog or that shell shock. Um, you know, March, for me, it was, uh, you know, March 9th, my kids called me in the morning. They, they go to school in Cambridge and on the East Coast, and I live in California, they called in the morning and said, you know, mom, they're sending us home. And that was like the first, you know, real personal change that I had to deal with was, you know, my two kids coming home from college um, really said like they called on, on, I think Monday or Tuesday and they were home, both of them were home on Friday. Um, and then from there, you know, by Monday morning, the following week, we were on shelter in place orders for um, Northern California. Um, and then, you know, so there was a period of just being shell shocked. And I think we're coming out of that a little bit. I'm seeing organizations, some organizations are still hunkering down, but a lot of them have really um, moved forward. And what those companies are doing is really refocusing on that forever promise that they make to their customers. So in the work that I do, and you know, in my, you know, this is my new book, The Forever Transaction. Um, my, my publicist says I have to show it every time I, I talk. So um, that was that. Was that. Um, there, <laughs> I like and it. please buy a copy, uh, you know, um, available in stores near you. Um, maybe, uh, actually probably not available in stores near you, but, um, available on Kindle for you to download. And, um, so, so the core idea is this idea of a forever promise, which is what do your customers want you to provide them forever? What is the thing that drives loyalty to your organization? Um, it might be something like if you're a consultant like I am or like Lisa is, it might be about I can bring you emerging findings and expertise um, in your space and I can work with you to help you take advantage of those insights. Or it might be you know, we help you get things from here to there, or it might be, we help things run smoothly. Um, but if you take that promise um, and you say, okay, if I were starting today, how would I deliver? How would I package that value? You might do it really differently than you did it when you were just getting started. So what I encourage you to do is sort of say, okay, who are my, who are my best customers? And what is that promise that they're expecting from me? And how do I deliver on it in the best way in this moment right now? And that way of thinking is really at the heart of what I call the membership economy, um, which is this massive transformation that we've all experienced. Um, I mean, the average American has uh, 18 subscriptions, so we're deep into this world right now, but it's this idea of treating your customers like a member. Um, and what that does is by you focusing on their long-term well-being, uh, they, in return, their trust goes up and they're more willing to stop looking for alternatives and say, for these problems or these goals that I have, I trust you, this organization, to solve those problems for me for the long term. And I'm not looking for alternatives. Um, and maybe even I'm going to pay you on a regular basis in automated fashion. So I'm going to even, you know, be willing to have you uh, bill me on a subscription basis. So that's really what I've been working on and thinking about for the last 20 odd years is, you know, starting with Netflix and, um, you know, in the early days I worked with Netflix and SurveyMonkey and uh, PayCycle, which is part of Intuit for small businesses. Um, but also more recently, you know, in the past five years working with organizations like um, you know the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, so you know heavy equipment and um, uh, AOX, the uh, the uh, American Oil Chemist Society, which are the you know the people who make all the the soap, uh, the world soap, and so different. Uh, and I got that that acronym wrong. It's the Association of Oil Chemists. That's so AOCS. Um, so but anyway, you know what we're seeing is that every business is starting to think like a membership business and starting to focus on what are the long-term ways I can add value and moving away from saying, I have this product or I provide this specific service to, I help my customer achieve their goals. 
So, you know, the forever transaction is that moment when the customer takes off their customer hat, puts on a member hat and stops looking for alternatives. And this is really what we're all trying to have. And honestly, right now in this moment, the businesses that have that, that have a forever transaction are proving to be the most resilient businesses because it's a lot easier to get a customer to continue paying and continue doing the habits they've always had than it is to get a lapsed customer, someone who bought something from you maybe last year to buy again this year, because that requires them to have a whole new buying process and make that decision all over. So more than ever, I think businesses are moving toward uh, how to build a forever transaction with their customers. I always like to share this slide, this you know giant logo slide, because if you take a look at this, you'll see that almost every industry, businesses of all kinds are moving to this model, are trying to you know smooth out all the lumpiness of their business model, both on the supply side and the demand side, by building their models around recurring relationships. So you can see on here some of the usual suspects. You know, when I talk about what I do, people immediately go to, oh, you do membership? Do you know, what do you know about Costco or Amazon Prime? But, you know, Burger King has a subscription now where you get unlimited coffee for $5 a month. Um, that's really interesting to me. Uh, Caterpillar, I'm sure many of you know this, uh, has publicly said they're moving toward a model where you don't buy the equipment anymore. You just subscribe to it. Uh, I've done some, some work and spent some time with uh, Carbon 3D, uh, which is a 3D printer company. You can't buy the printers from them. You can only subscribe to them. Uh, and they have this, you know, it's a much more distributed manufacturing model. They're working with um, Adidas. They're working with, I think it's Rydell, the, um, the football helmet manufacturers. They're working with a lot of um, dentists and orthodontists and private practice for the, the mouth guards that you can make them in the, in the, in the dentist's offices. Um, so they're thinking, you know, they talk about, you know, rethinking the entire manufacturing process um, as a subscription saying, how do we, you know, be, the reason that you don't get to own the devices um, is because they want to continue to evolve that device so that it's always the latest equipment for you and that the software continues to provide new value to their subscribers. So it kind of changes the whole, the whole model of manufacturing. So anyway, uh, this is everywhere. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about the phases because some of you might be in different phases in terms of thinking about these ideas. Um, you know, businesses are at very different uh, maturity levels in thinking this way. Uh, some are just getting started. Uh, some are scaling, like they've been doing it in a small way over here, and they're trying to kind of extend that DNA across the organization. And some have been doing this for their entire time in business. So like a lot of newspapers have always done a subscription that gets delivered to your home every day, Monday through Friday, or whatever their, their schedule is. And so for those organizations, it's about not getting too attached to the how, the way that they've always done it, and being willing to continue to evolve around that forever promise. So, you know, at each stage, there are different challenges. Um, in your launch phase, it's really about getting support from your organization, both in terms of, you know, a green light and in terms of resources. And that's certainly money and people, but it's also give, being given the time that you're going to need to tinker with the model, figure out your promise, find your best member, and get to that point of having product market fit. And by the way, the um, logos on the bottom are, are companies that I, that I featured and highlighted uh, in the book. And you'll see, you know, Carbon that I just mentioned uh, and Peloton are both, um, you know, physical products with subscription add-ons. And the Nike Adventure Club is a sneaker subscription uh, that Nike has been working on for the past several years. Uh, scale is really about once you've figured it out, how do you operationalize it? How do you, um, you know, if the first one is kind of held together with chewing gum and paper clips, how do you create the right infrastructure and the right processes 
to expand this rapidly and to grow. Um, and in this section, you know, I worked with, uh, uh, I, I, I looked at Microsoft um, moving to membership uh, in their office, on their office team. I looked at Haggerty, which is the Haggerty Drivers Club, uh, which is car insurance. Uh, and I looked at Electronic Arts, which is moving from a physical game to a subscription to a catalog of games. And I looked at um, Under Armour. So the question of do you acquire new businesses as a way of acquiring talent and uh, expertise in a new way of running your business. And then finally, I looked at the, um, I talked to the woman who's been running operations for the Miami Heat uh, and now runs operations for the Chase Center here in San Francisco which is the home, the brand new home of the Golden State Warriors. And how do you um, build a culture of membership in operations? And then the last section is about how you lead um, when you've already had a forever promise. How do you continue to use your microscope to look down at your current business and your current offerings and the way you do things and these incremental improvements, but how do you also look out onto the horizon and um, see what's coming, both in terms of, you know, what are your competitors doing? What other alternatives do prospects have? And also, how are those prospects making decisions? And what is it that they need? And how might those needs be changing over time? And for this section, I looked at, you know, theme parks. I looked at Weight Watchers, uh, moved to digital. I um, looked at uh, Spotify, and then I looked at a professional association um, as well to see how they continue to innovate and stay relevant. So, Robbie, we have we have a question. I figured I may as well, if, if that's yeah. okay, I break in. Uh, so. Um, the question is, is this concept of a membership oriented business model true only because of current enabling technology like the web or high speed networks, smartphones, et cetera? It's not true only because of that. I would say that people, consumers, customers, businesses have always wanted to partner with organizations that go beyond the product and solve the problem or help achieve the goal on an ongoing basis. That's the relationship we have or we want to have with our doctors. Um, it's the kind of relationship we want to have with our professional advisors. It's the relationship that we have with gyms and professional associations and trade guilds. Um, so it is something that people have always wanted. And we've had trade guilds, you know, since the 12th century. And, you know, we, some of this stuff is not new. Um, and businesses have always wanted recurring revenue. But as the questioner points out rightly so this technology has extended the infrastructure that allows us to have this kind of recurring formal relationship with our customers even if we don't know them personally and even if we're separated in space and time and so these technologies have made it not only possible to have subscription relationships but has also made it relatively cheap and easy for almost any organization to build a membership model. Um, and we're seeing solopreneurs and uh, influencers and small business owners building memberships uh, with very, very limited resources, as well as the largest um, and most well-capitalized organizations doing it. Thank you. Yeah, anything else or should I? Yeah, well, I have another, but I wasn't sure if I should ask it now or later. So, okay, um, this one is pretty broad. So what are some of the tips we need to consider when naming the membership program, like do's and don'ts? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, this is something that I actually really struggled with when, um, like when I was writing the book and then the first year or so that it came out, because at first I thought, well, wait, what is the membership economy business? And what's the definition? Because I know people are going to ask, and I'm struggling. I'm a very analytical person. How do I define this? And what I came up with is um, to be a membership economy organization, you don't need to call it a membership. Uh, you don't need to have subscription pricing. It's about the mindset of the organization. Um, and it doesn't matter what you call your customers. You know, Pandora calls them listeners. Uh, some people call them subscribers. Some people call them users, which I hate because it sounds like 
<laughs> drug addicts. Yeah, software um, companies for one, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, the important thing is the culture. Um, and then in terms of when you're actually naming your offering, um, something that I've seen with several businesses is that membership as a word is highly charged. So for example, um, I worked with a hospital system. So these were like, I don't know, like 30 hospitals across, um, across a pretty broad region that were run collectively. They were introducing a membership model sort of to be focused on health and wellness, um, as opposed to waiting till a person gets sick and then doing the transaction like, hey, let's bring them in for the procedure, let's fix the broken person, but more of a mindset of we're trying to help people have as many healthy minutes as possible. Um, and they did a lot of market research and they found that their patients and the, um, you know, the people that were insured by this system hated the word membership, that for them membership meant membership at a gym. And so we, you know, we ended up not using that word for them. Same thing, you know, the Guardian in the UK newspaper, they used the word membership to, to talk about, you know, they have people who subscribe or who access their content, but then they have members who support journalism. And they want those people, did not, the word membership to them implied more engagement with each other, which was not necessarily what that group wanted. What they really wanted was to be seen as supporters. And so the word supporters was used. So, so in summary, uh, great question. It is a really important thing to look into for your own community of you know, the people that you're trying to serve to get to the right, you know, the right nomenclature to convey both the offering that you have and the role of the recipients of that value. So should I keep going? Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, this, this came from my first book, uh, Membership Economy. And it's a seven step process that you can use if you're trying to design and improve this kind of a model in your organization. Um, everything starts in the middle with your product market fit, um, which is making sure that the offerings that you're providing are actually what the people you're trying to serve actually need. And in, in, in this case, when I think about membership, it's not enough to have that fit in a way that drives the initial transaction. So I think of that as a headline benefit, you know, join us and save, you know, 15% on your, you know, on your expenses that might be, or, you know, we'll solve this specific problem for you because we have this tool. That's a, that's a trigger benefit. That's a headline benefit that gets someone to join. But it's really important also to think about what are the benefits that you offer down the road that are going to drive engagement and retention. Um, that's how you think about product market fit. So it's not just for this moment, but it's for the ongoing. And then I just, you know, go around these, these seven steps. Um, I want to focus on just a couple. Organization uh, in the membership economy, um, you know, in a lot of businesses, functions are siloed. Operations is over here, marketing is over here, sales is over here, uh, finance is somewhere else. Um, in the membership economy, and Lisa, you talk about this actually quite a bit in your new paper, your new white paper, oh. <laughs> your, your book, um, this idea that, that there's got to be a lot more collaboration and integration, both in terms of the processes and the way that the different parts of the organization get their jobs done, and also in the shared metrics on the corporate dashboard. Uh, the second one I wanted to focus on is customer success, which is a concept uh, that I first saw with software as a service, where businesses realized if we depend on an ongoing relationship with our customers, it follows that we need to be more proactive in our customer support. So we can't just wait for people to call with a problem because in a subscription world, when people call with a problem, the first words out of their mouth are, I wanna cancel. So you have to think more proactively about support, that it's, it's you know, you have to choreograph the onboarding experience of a new customer so that they get the value that they came for right away, but also so that they develop habits that are gonna continue driving value for them so that they see no reason to leave. Um, so it's a very different way of looking at support functions um, 
a different kind of person that does customer success. They're more proactive. Um, they're more uh, uh, customer oriented. They're more about helping that customer optimize their experience than they're about solving a particular problem that presents itself. And then the last thing I want to talk about is technology. Um, in the membership economy, everybody's a technologist. Um, every buyer, uh, every seller, every support person, um, across the organization, it is no longer okay to say, I'm not technical. Everybody has to understand technology. Not that you have to be able to build it or that you have to be able to talk shop with an engineer, but you do have to be able to create requirements for your own area. And, you know, I come out of the product management world and, you know, I did spend a lot of time writing requirements for engineering teams. And I'm not an engineer. I studied poetry in college. Um, <laughs> I'm about as poet as you get at business school. But, you know, what I do know how to do is say, hey, I've been talking to customers and prospects. This is what they need. These are the requirements. Now I'm going to turn that over to you to figure out how to deliver on those requirements. That's what you can do with a technology vendor, right? You say, hey, this is the problem we're having. And I'm wondering if you're able to solve it with your technology. Um, so everybody in the organization needs to be able to do that. Uh, I want to close out by just reminding us that, you know, this too shall pass. Uh, you know, different parts of the country are opening up at different paces. Um, the question is, where do you want to be when, when things open up? Um, you know, what is the vision that you have for leaping forward right now? Um, how are you pivoting? How are you expanding? How are you creating? Um, and in this moment, when we all have implied permission to be a little more uh, aggressive, a little more nimble than normally uh, is business as usual. Um, so moving forward, I wanna encourage you as next steps to think about both looking with your microscope at how you're doing things right now and what you can tinker with um, to make it a better fit with your customers' ongoing needs. And also using that, you know, that telescope to look out onto the horizon and see what kind of options do your customers have that are being created right now? And where is it that you want to be you know, going out into the future? Uh, leave you with this one thing. Um, the secret to the forever transaction is that you need to love your customers and their mission, not your mission, but their mission, more than your own products. Um, the people on your team that do things a certain way, um, and the processes that those people do. You have to be willing to take a step back and say, you know, maybe we have to change our product. Maybe our process doesn't work um, as well today than it, as it worked, you know, even last quarter. And maybe, you know, we need to train our people, encourage our people to be more nimble and to be, you know, have more of a beginner's mind approach to learning and, and changing. Uh, I have some goodies, robbiekelmanbaxter.com slash audience, the slides, the membership manifesto, and also chapter eight of my new book, which is all about uh, changing your culture. And um, that's it. All right. That's well, it. I have, we have several yep. questions here, so we can make it interactive. So if anybody else has questions, please submit them through the Q&A or the chat mm -hmm. box. So Robbie, uh, does a forever promise ultimately imply mass customization that a business will have to be able to support? Yeah, this is a good question. It, I guess I would say it, it, it depends what you mean by mass customization. Um, here, here's where I would start. You, you start with knowing your audience really well and understanding a particular journey that they go on. So, you know, here's the problems they have early on. Here's what they have over time. Here's what they might have, you know, down the road. And thinking about your offerings as taking them on that journey because you want to keep any customer that you bring in through the front door, you want them to stay for a long time. And so you want to optimize for the journey. But if it's a journey that people go on, that lots and lots of people go on, um, you may not need to offer something different to this person than that person. Um, you can offer the same, the same feature. Uh, 
the risk comes when you take people with different use cases and try to you know, solve for every one of them. Uh, so hopefully, does that answer a question, Lisa? Yeah, I, I think also uh, from a manufacturing point of view, mass customization, or they might be thinking this, mass customization might mean yeah. like taking a product and actually customizing options. Like, you know, right. when you're producing a car, you you customize color and those kinds of things. And it, that's that's one option, but it doesn't have to be, I know from your right. from your conversations, that uh, you can customize the delivery of that product. You can customize mm -hmm. your ongoing interactions. But but you know, I'll, I think you're. I think you answered it well. Yeah. But that's what I'm no. thinking. No, that's a really good. I hadn't really thought of that. But like I do see, you know, so for example, with carbon, um, you know, the reason they seem to be doing so well is because they can customize for every individual. You know, they're they're making a different football helmet for every player in the NFL. Um, that is designed to fit his head and his specifications. Um, so, you know, in, that's the ideal that we all would want is, you know, mass, you know, mass customization that fits us. But I guess what I, what I also want to kind of point out is that um, it doesn't have to be every product being customized. Often it's about the experience and the, the communication and recognizing where they are in the journey. Um, so what might feel, you know, you and I have both worked with Alan Weiss and, you know, everybody feels like their problem is completely unique, but when you boil it down, the problems are the same. Uh, and if you can see those patterns, uh, it's a lot easier to have your customers feel like it's, it's custom, but actually um, it's, you know, you're kind of doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely true. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity on the, uh, you know, like you said, when customizing the experience, it could be the way you deliver the product, but it also could just be ongoing education you provide is what I think, you know, I picked up from you um, over time, or maybe creating a um, virtual or in-person uh, um, like you said, we don't, I don't really like the word user group either for that purpose, but you know, folks that are using the particular products is so that they can share information. Are, are those types of things that uh, um, may work for, um, for all, for manufacturing type businesses as well? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you want to take a step back and say, who are we providing value to and what's the value? Um, and that can be inside the organization. So you could say, well, we're providing value to the product designers or we're providing value um, to our, cust our end users who are trying to figure out, you know, how do I know when things are going to arrive or how they're going to arrive? Um, so providing, ex you know, you can package your value in a lot of different ways. And I think a lot of times, you know, we get out of school and there's a million things we can do. And then we take a job and we're suddenly like this. And so kind of reopening that and saying, what are all the ways I can add value? I can add value as an expert that can offer advice. Um, I can add value as somebody who can build things. I can offer value um, as somebody who can fix a problem, uh, you know, a support person. So sort of figuring out what are all the ways I can offer value and how can I layer in a lot of value so that my customer never wants to leave and always wants to stick with me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and because it relates, uh, I was working with a manufacturing client. This one makes food. Um, and what I've noticed, and I wanted to run this by you, but what I've noticed is, is that uh, it's even more important to understand their customers' customers, maybe yes. customers' customers' customers, and what they're doing with the product and what would be of value to them and how they're using it. Because right now, yes how they're using it could be dramatically different in terms of what it is that the, uh, who's buying it and whether or not volume is going up or down. But, but just in general, if you can provide value to your customers, customers, I'm thinking that that goes a long way in this process. Would you, have you found that to be yeah. true? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, one of the big questions that I always work with organizations on is who is your best customer and who do you want to optimize your, your recurring revenue relationship with. So for example, if you have an intermediary, if you sell to someone who then sells to someone else, or you sell to someone who serves someone else, or you go through a dealership, 
um, any kind of intermediary, one of the ways that I'm seeing a lot of organizations use these principles is to be able to go direct to the end user for all kinds of reasons, right? You, you reduce mm -hmm. costs, um, you get better data, which allows you, as you said, to be more nimble in terms of creating the offering for the people who actually have to use it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of risk there because if you've been working through somebody and now you're suddenly going around them, there's some issues of um, channel conflict. Uh, yeah. But I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing manufacturers that want to bypass their dealers. I'm seeing, uh, you know, HBO, for example, you know, the content creators, right? They've always gone through cable companies and satellite companies. And that's how you get, you get HBO through some other relationship that you have. But now you can get HBO direct on your phone and you can cut the cord, right? Right. That's, that's an example of businesses that are really changing their model or, you know, kind bars, you know, which was on my everything chart, right? Historically you buy kind bars at the store, right? At the supermarket or at the health food store. And now they're saying, well, for, we have some, they know that they have some best customers end users of the food product, as you said, who, um, first of all, they want a lot of kind bars and they don't ever want to run out. And second of all, they have preferences on the flavors. And so, you know, if you've ever gone to the supermarket and not had your flavor of your energy bars, when you eat them, you know, every day at four o'clock, it's like very agonizing. And <laughs> so if you can order direct, and maybe the price is lower, and maybe you get exposed to the new products that are emerging, um, that's great for that customer. And it's also, you know, there's a great value proposition for that end customer. And it's also great for the manufacturer, for the brand, because they're getting insights from their best customers. Um, also, they're less dependent, I mean, there's the other stuff that comes up, which is they're way less dependent. If they can move enough of their business to direct, they're no longer quite so beholden to their intermediaries. So yeah, this is a trend, you know, back to the, the comment about everybody thinks they're unique, but really there's patterns. Many, many industries are dealing with that, with that very question of, do I, go, do I go through the intermediaries? Do I make an end run? Who is the, the customer that I really wanna serve? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and actually, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good point. And what I'm seeing is, is that certainly the trend is to go direct and to source locally, um, or, you know, bring sourcing closer to the manufacturing operations with that, or with, the, I should say, bring sourcing closer to the customer. However, with that said, if it's not, not in all cases, is it possible to um, go around whoever is next in the chain? And, and maybe you don't want to. So you could still, though, establish relationships is what I'm seeing and what, you know, I'm, I'm hearing Robbie say by um, establishing programs with them so that you can, if you have your customers, customers requesting uh, that you gain, um, that, that they, uh, they want your support, then you're going to, you're going to end up growing your business. So anyway, sorry mm -hmm. to take over there, but I thought that's an no, important yeah. Uh, right. point and it relates to this group. So, um, all right. So I have several questions here. So can you give some examples of companies or industries where a member economy is not very relevant? Yeah. I love <laughs> this question. What a good question. Um, this used to be a very bad question when I didn't have an answer, but now I have an answer. So it's good. Um, <laughs> uh, any, so there's two ways of answering this. So the first one is businesses that structurally don't demand it. And those are any businesses where sales and marketing isn't important. So I gave a talk in 2015, right after my first book came out, um, to the annual meeting of Vistage, right? All the, um, you know, kind of business leaders. And there were like, I don't know, 700 of them in the room. And I gave my talk. And then people came up to me in the hall during the break and said, hey, and these are true things. Hey, I run a fleet of commercial fishing boats and we sell our fish every day at market prices, um, whatever we have. How can this work for me? Right? Well, they don't care about marketing or sales because their business doesn't have that. They sell to the saints. So there's only one buyer and that buyer buys based on commodities. Uh, 
another example, last gas for a hundred miles, right? They don't treat me well. Like, what am I going to do? If my tank is empty, I'm going to buy gas from them and I may never go this way again. So who cares if I hate them? Um, you know, if they treat me badly, uh, if you have the medicine that I need to stay alive, um, I'm going to find you. And I, it doesn't matter how you market it or how you sell it. If it works, I'm going to buy it from you. Um, so any business that doesn't need sales and marketing may not need this. But I will point out that when you have businesses like the ones I just described, where the customer is treated badly because they're a captive audience, um, those are the cases where you see innovation, where, where entrepreneurs say, wow, customers are really unhappy. I'm going to find a solution to make them happy and steal this business from the incumbent. Um, for example, what we saw with Uber and the taxi, the medallion taxi uh, drivers in, in New York, right? They had a medallion. They were the only game in town. So if the car was dirty and they were rude to you and they didn't stop for you, there was nothing to do because they were the only game in town. Now we have an, an alternative. Um, the other reason when I think membership doesn't work is if you're, this is more inside your company, which is if your leadership does not think this is a priority, or if you have a culture in your organization that's very product centric or very um, sales centric, kind of quarterly capitalism kind of an organization where everything's about this month's revenue. I've never seen have, those. <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's hard if you're like some you know, really ambitious, starry-eyed middle manager saying, I am going to change this company and make them membership oriented. I mean, you're fighting a losing battle. And I would say, you know, I would not want to risk my career on that transformation without the right resources and the right leadership. So you asked, where does membership not work? I wouldn't I, if I weren't the owner of the business, I would not try to lead from within uh, if I didn't know that I had ample support from above. Well, and actually, I think that's a very interesting comment because I have a feeling that uh, emerging from this pandemic, especially supply chain and operations uh, folks, which we have on the line, are going to have their choice of, um, you know, they're going to be in high demand. So, um, yeah. Those are interested in, in uh, customer success will leave. So executives on yes. the line, take note. <laughs> yeah, I think that's such a good point, Lisa, because um, I think in a lot of organizations, um, first of all, manufacturing is just now, I think, starting to have a tremendous amount of innovation. Um, and, you know, these ideas of, of how, you know, you can, you can subscribe to durable goods, heavy equipment, right? Peloton, uh, you know, the, the carbon example, um, you know, that's interesting by itself. And that's kind of changing how, how manufacturing is seen. Um, and I think, as you pointed out right now, we're all realizing how dependent we are on operations and on supply chain and starting to say, wait a minute, how can I use this as a strategic advantage or at least not have it as a, you know, a strategic risk? So it, you know, the people that are most, if, if you have something to say about this topic, um, now is the time to be saying it, right? I would really encourage people to build their, you know, if you're on the line, be building your professional brand right now and your point of view about what organizations should be doing in the next three, six, 18 months. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really, really good point. And actually you just gave me an idea. I think that folks should be thinking about how the supply, get providing visibility and assurances and um, innovative, um, I don't know, uh, updates related to supply chain might become <laughs> more relevant it is going to become more relevant following this pa pandemic and i think that that could be one way to provide a forever uh transaction yeah, yeah i think i way. mean just just even brainstorming right now with you lisa like i would think if i were running an operations team right now in an organization i would be marketing the heck out of my department right now 
Like I would want to make sure that leadership understands what we do, that power players across the under organization understand who I am and what I do and what I can do for them. Um, kind of building my own forever transaction inside the organization, as well as, you know, direct with, with customers because you're having a moment, right? Everybody's realizing like, whoa, we underinvested in this space. And now we need to understand what's going on. So this is a great opportunity to have an operations newsletter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? just for your absolutely. Colleagues. Actually, really yeah. good point. All right. Well, so let's see. We have, can you share how, how you see this model be applied to a company that provides a commodity that may be difficult to have a forecast of needs versus being a more reactive customer with a new need? that made them contact us. Wow, that's, that's a little Yes, I think I understand. I, okay. I, you know, I got this question, I think I mentioned that I spoke at, at the AOX um, uh, conference uh, last year. So the, the soap industry, I'm just, um, am I still, are my slides still showing? Yes, they are. I can't figure out how to turn them off. I'm happy to turn them off so that people oh, can well, see us just, again. I can probably, I don't know if you, you do it. If you go towards the top, I, I can look and see here. Yeah, for some, because. Uh, yes, I, I can do that. <laughs> there oh, you go, Robbie. You. <laughs> Yay. Okay, now I can see Lisa. Um, so we were talking, okay, so the question is about commodities. So let's say that you sell um, some, some um, ingredient, uh, that, that your clients need. You sell some kind of plastic or you sell some kind of, you know, I don't know, some kind of chemical. Um, you can tell how technical I am. Remember, I'm a <laughs> poet. Uh, but you sell something like that and you're like, well, we don't know. You know, they, they tell us what they need based on their forecasts, which aren't always accurate. Um, and so then they just call us and maybe Especially they even now. call us and they call five other providers as well. Um, and then they look for the, the cheapest price. So what you want to do there if your product itself, your re, you know, so for example, with carbon, it's about their resins, right? If your product isn't differentiated, that's, that's kind of one area for innovation, which is to be seen as a more strategic partner, but that's kind of over here. That's one option. Another option, short-term, it's always most expensive to, to do it with the product itself, right? So you really want to be sure that you're doing the right thing. But what you can do is with the services around that right? That you could say, okay, you know, you're still buying our products in a very lumpy way when you need them. But um, if you're a member of our loyalty program, which is not the right language, but you know, if you're a preferred vendor, you get, um, you know, no surge pricing, as they say at Uber, uh, you good. get, you know, you know, so you might pay a fee up front and say, you're my preferred vendor, I pay you a fee up front. And in exchange for that, I get a bundle of benefits, which are a bundle of benefits that your best customers would want from you. So it might be no surge pricing. It might be um, expert advice, uh, access to whoever the expert is on that product. Um, it might be training that you provide to, you know, you might have programs to train on how to use this, you know, these products best or whatever. But in other words, it's saying, okay, I know that I'm still going to have the lumpiness of the sale, but I'm going to do something. I'm going to add a layer of value for my best customers so that they pay a premium um, to, to get a better experience. And I'm seeing a lot of businesses do this right now. Uh, this is what Amazon Prime is, right? They sell commodities, right? They sell commodities and they don't even make most of those commodities, right? They sell other people's stuff. But if you're a member of Amazon Prime, you know, you get fixed shipping costs, right? You pay that one fee and then shipping is included. Um, you get access to a bunch of other benefits like in their case, video and storage. Um, and so that's, you know, you still pay for it in that case, but it's a way for them of smoothing things out and also a way of making people commit to their company, right? Like once you sign up for Amazon Prime, you go there first, free shipping. Uh, so that would be a way that I would think of it. Another option is to offer something like uh, Bain and Company, the consulting firm, has a program called the Net Promoter, what is it, the Bain Net Promoter System Loyalty Program and lo Loyalty Forum. And it's a group of all of the senior um, customer-facing executives. So the head of retail or the head of customer support, 
they gather every six weeks or so um, and they get presentations by Bain partners, relevant presentations by Bain partners on emerging content and they get presentations by fellow members, right? So another element of this offering for this commodity business, for the membership is access to the other members and to the, the, the innovations that they have, the challenges they have, building relationships under your brand umbrella is incredibly sticky and incredibly valuable. So, you know, with Bain, they have that program, they charge a pretty penny for it, but it's nothing compared to what they charge for the big, deep, seven-figure strategy projects. But it's a way of deepening the relationship and making Bain the preferred vendor for those big projects. Absolutely. That's, that's a really good point. Um, so does, we have a question here, does the membership economy also imply non-ownership of assets? I think that's right. Sometimes, yes. And um, this was another one of those hard questions that I, that I faced and I, I feel like I have a better kind of <laughs> grasp on it now, if, you know, 20 years into this, this world. Um, in some, so I always say, you know, membership economy, there's four kind of major tools that you have if you're moving from that transactional model to, you know, to a membership economy mindset. Um, it's from ownership to access or transactional to relational. So, you know, anonymous to known relationship. Um, so how do you get to know them better? It can be about a single payment to many recurring payments, and it can be about community from one-way communication, not just to two-way communication, but um, connection among your, your customers under your brand umbrella. You can use those four elements as like a painter's palette to design your own model. Um, but you don't have to use any one of them. So for example, Stitch Fix, the clothing um, membership, they send you a box of clothing items and you own those. So it's not about access. You're not renting clothes, you're buying them. But what you're, what you're getting in the membership is curation. Somebody choosing those items for you based on your body type and your lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah, really good, really good point. Well, it's a good thing that uh, you've you've had so many speeches; they got all these doozies <laughs> ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we have two related to software type um, uh, services, so what, you know they're sort of related. So one's saying, you know, like how do you handle this challenge when buyers are um, used to basically negotiating on price and getting multiple bids? And they're trying to, and actually this could relate to, you know, manufacturing as well. Certainly we're conditioned to get multiple bids and, and deal on price. Um, and so the same thing is true for software. The question is, how would you uh, best, best handle that? Um, is, yeah. Is really so, what saying. yeah, so this is a problem, I think, of, of every business and not just membership businesses, which is you want to get out of competing on price. Right. It doesn't matter. This is not Robbie, the membership economy person. This is just Robbie, the business person saying like, you don't want to be in a situation where you're seen as a commodity um, because you have no differentiated value. So whatever you're doing, that's kind of the first thing that I would say is, you know, have some value that actually, you know, have some value that makes you better for, for some than others and know who you're better for. So be, be a little more focused on what you do. Almost always, um, there's this new book out, I'll just tout it, it's not my book, but David Ocker, um, who's probably the greatest living brand strategist in the world. Uh, you know, he wrote, so literally wrote, uh, I know. <laughs> well, he wrote, I mean, he literally wrote all the textbooks that are used for marketing. Um, he runs Profit Brand Strategy. He's a professor emeritus at, at uh, Haas at, at Berkeley. Um, he has a new book out about subcategories and talking about this idea that, you know, the easiest and best ways to become, to grow and be more profitable is to pick a subcategory where you are differentiated. So that's something that I would, that I would suggest. The other thing to keep in mind is that the person that you're negotiating with on the other side at your customer, their job is negotiating with vendors. So they do not want to stop negotiating with you because they will not have a job anymore. 
So you need to also think about who you're going to sell to and who's going to advocate for a new model because it's better for the organization to not have to negotiate and just know they're getting a good price and great value. But some people in the organization are not going to react well to your new model. So keep that in mind too, that you may not want to sell this to the same person you've been selling to. Very true. And I'm assuming that it, there's a question here about the length of time it takes to implement a subscription, but I'm guessing that it relates to how, uh, what you're implementing. You can probably implement something relatively quickly that gets you started and then a more complex program would take longer is my guess, but is it? I'll let you. Yeah, go. absolutely. Absolutely. Start with the minimum viable product, something small that's really going to nail one problem for your customer. Even if your vision, you know, Amazon started with books, right? It wasn't even free shipping. It was just books. And today look at where they are. And, and Jeff Bezos always had that vision that his forever promise was, you know, the most friction free way to buy anything. But he started with just one thing, books. Interesting. Well, thank you, uh, Robbie. That's, it's been very helpful. And if uh, there's, I saw a few questions about how to do all of this. So I definitely would recommend uh, Robbie's books. Uh, both of them help you to lay out a program uh, to get started with um, the, uh, you know, developing a program like the subscription, uh, a subscription model of the membership economy. So um, obviously Robbie has her newest one behind her so um and we'll send out uh -huh. actually robbie if you and i have the old link. one over there <laughs> oh, there you go very good yeah send us a link to both and we'll um we'll include it with the uh, webinar archives oh perfect um, thanks so, so much uh, for having me yeah yeah thank you very much and uh before we wrap up i wanted to let everyone know that uh, to continue to watch for our emails we actually have just confirmed a couple more webinars which i'm really excited about one is with uh, Esri, uh, which is um, world renowned. They're working actually with uh, all the movers and shakers you hear about where's uh, COVID going and how, how, you know, how soon can we, op re we reopen and what is, um, you know, what should they plan for? Because that with their data models, they have um, insight into how all that works. And so that'll be a really interesting, um, uh, webinar and that's going to be uh, next week on the 12th and then we also have one um, with uh, Shamrock Foods and they're going to talk about uh, distribution and delivery systems and and um, what's uh, what's working during these uh, during these uh, turbulent times and what we should carry over into the future for from a distribution standpoint and we're also look, working on a couple more so, so stay tuned and i want to thank you robbie again for for joining us today it's been really helpful and i think we really if there's actually one thing we should be thinking about during this pandemic to me it's it's um how we create um you know enhanced customer loyalty so i think your um, session has been yeah. you know proven right. invaluable to that end so thank you Good. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me, Lisa. All right. Thank you.